All right. <clears throat> Thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, we're, we, the PCBH SIG, are really excited about today's presentation. We have Dr. Ebony Winford with us, um, who will be presenting on a very important and timely topic, um, working with Black patients in primary care. So thank you everybody. Thank you, Dr. Winford, for being with us. <clears throat> and let's just go ahead and get started with some quick housekeeping stuff so that we can Give the floor to Dr. Winford and uh, sit back and take a bunch of useful information. Um, so let me just go ahead and share my screen right now. Oh, also, um, we will be sharing the slides from the presentation at the end. Uh, Dr. Winford has shared those with us and we will be sending them out to everyone, everybody. Okay, so quick housekeeping stuff. Again, thank you, everybody. This is our first um, PCBH SIG uh, quarterly meeting. I know April is a little bit late, but we had to make sure that we had a great presentation going for y'all. So I hope we deliver. Um, <clears throat> but as a reminder, this is your 2021 leadership. I'm Yahira Johnson Esparza. Um, I was a co-chair last year with Dr. Clarissa Aguilar. This year, um, Kelly Bozak is co-chairing with me. Uh, Haley Van Sirk, secretary, you all, I th these are all folks we had the last year. Tanya Norma, we have two student reps this time around. We have Natalie Garza and Rosemary Hale, who have been excellent contributors. <clears throat> and we're pretty excited to have them on board. Okay, quick updates uh, for the SIG. We have started, or we're in the process of creating a PCBH mentorship connector. The goal of this connector program is to connect papers members of the PCBH community with quality mentorship. Now this could be either one-to-one -one mentorship. There's also been some interest in peer, men peer group mentorship. So that's something that's in the works. We have gotten a lot of folks who have been interested. We're currently working through, through the list, trying to figure out what this, what this is going to look like. So at this point, we have mentors. If you are interested in mentorship, please also shoot us an email um, so that we can go ahead and try to set you up with a mentor who can help you and whatever it is that you need help with. PCBH related. Um, Kelly, do you want to take over and talk a little bit about the newsletter? Yep, just a quick update. We sent out a newsletter to everyone in our PCBH SIG list. And so if you're interested if through this webinar or through hearing about the PCBH SIG, we encourage you to join, um, at least to follow some of our emails. We don't send out too many, um, but we are going to be sending out this new quarterly newsletter that has some updates about the SIG meetings, share some PCBH stories. So shout out to David Bo uh, Bowman for sharing a recent story from their clinic, featured research, and then as well as a member spotlight. Um, so if there's anybody you want to spotlight who's doing great work in PCBH, feel free to let us know. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And I, I want to reiterate the kudos to David Bowman for, he really is the inspiration of the PCBH stories. I think we all enjoy his stories and we figured in addition to his blog, it'd be nice to also include it in the newsletter. So he was gracious enough to offer the first story. I hope you all had a chance to read that because it was excellent. And I do want to give kudos to our student reps. They're the ones who handled the featured research section of the newsletter. So thanks again, Natalie and Rosemary for helping us out with that. <clears throat> Quick update also on, on SLIP, Serving Latinx Patients in PCBH. This is a, a task force that is, held, that is uh, largely led by, by Norma and myself. Um, we have some exciting things with this as well. We are looking for folks who want to join SLIP and who are interested in being involved at a leadership level. So please let us know if you are interested. Norma has also sent out a newsletter on this. She has been working on podcasts. Recently, she did a great podcast with Dr. Lisa Fortuna, who's a chief of psychiatry um, in California. And she's an excellent researcher, uh, clinician and researcher who looks to address Latino health disparities. So excellent podcast, stay tuned. I think it's in the works and that it will be, it will be posted um, in the CFHA podcast sometime soon. Okay. Now, oh, sorry, not yet. Sorry, psych. Save the dates, upcoming SIG membership meetings, obviously today's, but the next one's coming up Monday, July 12th at 1 Eastern. Our third quarterly meeting will take place during the CFHA conference. Date and time will be TBD, obviously. Um, and Monday, December 13th at 1 p.m. Eastern, 
Um, I do want to make, just so y'all know the December one, we're excited about that one because it will be like a recap of everything that's happened in the year um, and a nice way to seal the, the year, hopefully. So now I'll hand it over to Tanya, who will go ahead and introduce our speaker. It is my pleasure to introduce Ebony Winford. So Dr. Winford and I actually went to school together. We completed our PhDs from um, UNC Charlotte where we met. And Dr. Winford also completed her um, master's in public health from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. As you can see, we already mentioned, uh, Dr. Winford is going to be talking today about cultural humility and working with black patients in primary care, such an important topic. We're so happy to have her. Um, so with a little bit more background, so Dr. Winford is the Director of Research and Health Equity, and she's a licensed clinical psychologist at Cherokee Health Systems in Knoxville. Tennessee. Um, she's also the clinical lead for the Cherokee Health Systems Consultation and Training Program, which uh, provides on-site training to other primary care organizations who are looking to integrate practices. Um, she does a lot. <laughs> so she also um, holds a lot of membership roles, obviously in CHA and other organizations. And she's also an adjunct faculty member at um, the Department of Family and Community Medicine at Meharry Medical College, and she's also a part-time lecturer at um, University of Tennessee, Knoxville. So, Ebony, we really appreciate you taking the time to uh, do this presentation. We're super excited, so welcome. Hello, everyone. I'm trying to find my, uh, my controls on all the screens that I have. Um, I'm excited to be here with you all. So here's how I roll, okay? Um, I have the chat box open on one side. You all can unmute whenever. And so I really want this to be as, as interactive as we can. Um, I don't mind being interrupted while we're talking. Um, and I just want to give the caveat. There are two caveats, actually. One, you're going to hear at least two curse words in this presentation. <clears throat> okay. There's a video that has at least one F-bomb, okay? Um, I don't apologize for that because I think it truly, truly, truly captures what, um, what I wanna get across. Um, and secondly, um, if you're not uncomfortable with this conversation, then that means I didn't do something right. And so I really want you to feel uncomfortable as you speak with me today. That's probably one of the weirdest things that you've heard. But if you walk away feeling warm and fuzzy, then that means I didn't do it right. Okay, I don't want anyone feeling warm and fuzzy when we talk about the impact of racism, because um, that's essentially what we have to talk about when we're talking about working with black people. You cannot talk about working with black people in any clinical setting unless we acknowledge the R word. Racism, not race, is the thing that undergirds the disparities and inequities that we see. So we're going to talk about those things today. All right, everybody's still on board with getting uncomfortable with hearing at least one F bomb. Okay. Um, Yes. Okay. This is also being recorded because there are several people who were not able to join us. Um, the pre, oh, I like that, Bridget. Yes, we're ready. Okay. So like our prep before, like we started going and realized that we were um, actually recording, we were like dropping all the F-bombs. So like if Leanna wants to put like <laughs> the real version of this recording on the internet, you'll get Ebony unfiltered but whatevs. All right. Either way, as you can see, I'm very informal. And so please like interact with me as we go. But again, my goal is not to make you comfortable. Um, and I, I have three caveats. Okay. This is the last one. It just came to me. Note that this work and this discussion that we're going to have, um, it almost always falls on people who look like me because it's that lived experience. I think that that has power. Um, and so just note that whenever I agree to talks like this, it literally is a labor of love because I want to make sure that people hear lived experience and that they can take that and possibly apply my lived experience, the shared lived experience that I might share with you as you work with individuals, no matter your role in the clinic. And so um, it's not, not lost on me that brown and black people are often talking about how to not be racist. Um, and so I just, again, call it out. Right Again, my goal is not to make you comfortable, it's just to be transparent and to, and to push it out. So that's the first thing that I hope made you squirm just a little bit, okay? You're welcome, Denise. Alrighty, 
let's talk about contextual factors. And so these are the things that are going to undergird our conversation. I have no magic solutions for you. There is no, if a black person does this, then you do this. There is no, if you make somebody cry in this way, then you apologize in that way. Context is what's really going to matter. And so I'm just giving you a bunch of context today in hopes that you recognize the context the next time you have an interaction with someone who's black. Alrighty, so we're going to talk about privilege, racism, social determinants of health, and microaggressions. The microaggression piece is where we're going to hear the F-bomb. Alrighty, so let's just settle upon the definition of privilege, okay? It's when a group of people are entitled to get special things just because of the group they belong in, not because they've done anything in particular to deserve it. So here's how we're going to set this up. Raise your hand if you are right-handed. Put it up, let me see. Okay, even if your camera's not on, give me like a, a, high, a yellow high five or something. Beautiful, beautiful. All righty. So I'm gonna speak only to us right-handed people, okay? Um, let me see. If you are right-handed, when is the last time you had to take a pair of scissors and like flip your arm like this so you could like cut it in a way that like didn't lean to the side but you actually cut it? Raise your hands if you've done that recently. So y'all might need to clear these hands. <laughs> okay, let's assume this is now an ice cream scooper and this is the thumb, okay? For us right-handed people, when's the last time you tried to scoop ice cream with the ice cream scooper, which is usually on this side, but then had to flip it literally upside down to open it and scoop to get the ice cream to come out? Raise your hand if you've done that recently. Okay, um, I got another one. For us right-handed people, this is a spiral notebook. When's the last time you wrote on your spiral notebook and had a dent of all the spirals right here on your arm from writing on your spiral notebook as a right-handed person? Raise your hand if you've had that recently. Okay, one more question. Can you all tell me when you asked to be right-handed? Like at what point in your conception when your parents did their thing, at what point did you put in the request to be right-handed? Anyone remember? Never, right? That's privilege. Okay. And some people have a lot of difficulty acknowledging that you hold privilege. And the easiest way for me to get that across is for us to talk about being right-handed. Okay. Not one of us asked to be right-handed, but it is a privilege in a world that's dominated by right-handed things. Almost everything is designed for people with right hands, even though the left-handed gene is the dominant one. But the prevalence of right-handedness in the world means that we cater everything to people who are right-handed. So I want us to replace right-handed with white. Replace right-handed with heterosexual. Replace right-handed with cisgender. Replace right-handed with English speaking, US born, educated, more than middle class. Replace all the right-handed words with any other piece of privilege that you might find yourself feeling uncomfortable about. And if you can tell me when you asked for those things, then we can talk. But I bet none of you asked for any of the privileges that you have. I can't recall asking in the middle of my parents' conception story of, of me, be like, hey, you know what y'all should do? You should make sure that when you're done, you have a right-handed kiddo. And none of us can ask for that. So I want us to keep that definition of privilege in our minds. So when I call on all of us to acknowledge our privilege, just put up your right hand. And if you can accept that you didn't ask to be right-handed, you can accept that you didn't ask to be white. You can accept that you didn't ask to be cisgender. You can accept that you didn't ask to be heterosexual. Okay. You can accept a lot of things if we can acknowledge that we didn't ask to be right-handed. We good? Anyone squirming in their belly yet? Good. All righty. So this is one of my favorite slides ever. So we're just going through the context. Social determinants of health is what's next. This is truly, truly, truly one of my favorite slides because I think it explains so well what happens when we think about the context in which racism um, impacts care, okay? So when we think about the social determinants of health, we have all those things on the left that healthy people 2020 and now 2030 have given us. But I get really excited looking at the picture, okay? Why do I get so excited? Read some of the words for me, right? Like you might see affordable, safe quality housing, access to parks, equity 
in county practices, access to affordable, healthy local food, community and public safety, access to efficient transportation, quality education, access to health and human services. But has anyone who's ever seen this picture ever looked at like how the words match up with the leaves? The color of the words match the color of the leaves? That's why this is one of my all time favorite things because look what happens. The words are the root causes and they are literally the roots of this tree, right? And so when we are thinking about, I'm a plant, plant mama, look back here. There are literally 20 plants here in my office, okay? So I know, I know a thing or two about roots. You have got to nurture the roots if you want anything green to show up, okay? These are worth adding to the roots. Freedom from police and racial violence. Exactly. Freedom from murder. That'd be cool, right? Um, but these are the root causes, okay? So why is that so important? Well, the leaves are the result of what's supplied to the tree via the roots. We are part of the root system. Yes, the slides will be given to you. They've already been supplied to uh, CFHA and they will pass them to you. But look at access to health and human services, look at equity, look at law and justice system is really the injustice system, but we're gonna roll with the picture for now. Um, economic development, right? These are the roots, we are the roots, okay? What roots have we supplied to our patients? And notice that they're not all positive. Some of these roots are bias. Some of these roots are racism. Some of these roots are cisgenderism, heterosexism, the system, right? But we are either serving as roots or we're serving to water or nurture the roots. And I want us to question what roots have we supplied? What roots have we helped to thrive, whether it's good, bad, or ugly? Because what we supply, what we nurture, then grows to fruition on the tree, okay? So we all have a role. And just imagine if the tree were the healthcare system, the primary care setting, and we are just one root, but look how many different colors leaves are produced from that one root at the bottom, right? We have a big impact that we could make. Um, I'm not going to show this video, even though it's one of my all time favorites, because I want to talk a little bit more. But let me tell you, I'm a fangirl for one minute. <clears throat> if I ever meet Dr. Kamra Jones, I might cry. Okay, like I'm her biggest fan. And she's just in Atlanta, which is about three and a half, four hours from me. I haven't timed it or anything. Um, but if we weren't in a pandemic, I may have accidentally on purpose, like considered driving to where she works saying, hey, Dr. Jones, I'm Ebony and I want to be like you when I grow up. But the reason I want to be like her when I grow up is that she's one of the, the best badass people that I've ever met in my life. Um, and she highlights what racism is. And I have grown so much in my ability to acknowledge racism at action when I ask the question, how is racism showing up here? There's no question of if it's showing up here. The first question she challenges us to ask is how is racism showing up here? So in our work with patients in primary care, how is racism showing up? Okay. Part of the clinician contribution to racism in healthcare is our keeping silent in the face of institutional barriers and cruelties, linkage or linked to privilege of holding silence in the face of oppression. Yes, silence or the ability to say nothing is a privilege because if it doesn't affect you, then you're not compelled to speak, right? Which is why I started this talk by saying the burden is often on people who are oppressed to speak up, but then we get damaged more, okay? But silence is a privilege, okay? But Dr. Jones tells us that racism is a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks. Just so we all know race isn't real, Racism is real, but race is random. Like somebody was like, oh, you're lighter than this person. So that means that you're less important than this person because your skin is darker than that person. It literally has no biological basis whatsoever. Racism is a whole system of things that has led us to this conversation today. Racism unfairly disadvantages people and groups, right? So we're talking about black patients right now. Racism, whether it is like overt or the bias in our thoughts, right? it negatively affects people. It gives unfair advantages to some people. Um, and my favorite part that she says is that it saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. 
for those people who have experienced racism, can I tell you that we're tired? Like y'all have heard me say this before. CFHA is my family. Y'all have heard me say this before. Can we tell you that we're tired? Like it literally saps your resources, your energy, your cognitive energy, your emotional energy, your ability to connect empathically with any patient that you're serving. It's exhausting, okay? And so she goes on to say that there are three types of racism, individual, those are the thoughts and actions and things that we as people carry out. Think about being like in the medical setting or the primary care setting, what thoughts do we have about our patients before they even open their mouths? How does that influence the care that we provide them? No matter what role you're in, notice I'm speaking very generally because I know that we come from different domains and disciplines. It could be institutional. Does your organization have rules and policies that are unfair to some? Let me give you an example. Let's say there is a rule in your clinic that if you miss three appointments in a row, you can't schedule again. That has the potential to be a racist policy because who's more likely to be negatively affected by the transportation barriers and the other social determinants of health that might serve as a barrier to getting into healthcare? People who are members of minoritized groups, okay? So if your policy at your clinic is three no-shows and you're out, who are you keeping out? Right? Our goal, we think, oh my goodness, if we do a no-show policy, then it's going to be about getting more people in. But I challenge you to ask, who are you keeping out with that policy? And so those are some of the things that we may not even think twice about. And then cultural, symbols and practices. For me, there are portions of Tennessee, even where we have clinics, because Cherokee Health Systems has 24 clinics across the whole state of Tennessee, there are some clinics I will not visit. You want to know why? Because along the way, I'm going to see at least three Confederate flags. I don't feel safe driving on that road. What if my car runs out of gas? What if my tire gets flat and I have to stop on this road with three Confederate flags? I'm simply not going to those clinics. And it doesn't mean that we condone racism, right? It means that along the way to our clinic where we're serving people, I fear my life and I'm not doing it. That's a cultural symbol, right? But it, then it impacts our ability to provide care because what if they're patients who have to pass that symbol on the way to our clinic? That's not our property, we can't change it, but it's still causing problems. Bridget says, especially for us FQHCs, we eradicated BHC no-shows, yes, but haven't extended that to medical yet. More work to do indeed, yeah. Because it's not just who are we open the door for, but who are we keeping out? As FQHCs, as integrated primary care behavioral health teams, our goal is access. We want people to get through these doors, but in our attempts to get people in, we are inherently blocking people out. And so we got to challenge what we think about those, those policies. Here's some of the impacts of racism. These pictures are just, you know, from the gardener's tale that if you click the link, once you get the PDF, you can watch Dr. Jones, my, my favorite person ever in life. She'll give you the whole spiel. But for the purposes of this, um, the latest, greatest unfortunate news is the maternal mortality rates. Hopefully everyone saw last year in particular, the information about racial discordance and how it literally kills people. Um, black newborns born to black physicians are more likely to live than black newborns born to non-black physicians. The highest maternal mortality rate is among black women and it's not because we all collectively decided to have bad genes and that we decided we wanted to die when we had kiddos, because that's not it. And if you're not careful, that is how the narrative gets shifted. We start looking at what's wrong with Black women and what can we do to make Black women more healthy instead of challenging the systems that might make it such that they're more likely to die. Breast cancer, insert health outcome here. People who are minoritized and who have experienced racism are more likely to experience the negative component of that. Psychological diagnoses. Um, in a few slides, we'll talk about how things like psychosis have been disproportionately applied to Black patients. And it started during times of enslavement because there was a mental health diagnosis if a formerly enslaved person tried to run away for freedom. They said, oh my goodness, they're psychotic. How dare they leave their masters? And that has continued, which is why we oftentimes see, yeah, minoritized. Because we're not minorities, we've been minoritized by the majority system. 
and I'm very mindful of words that I use. Um, it is Black Maternal Health Week. Yep, 11th through the 17th. Yep. And we're giving y'all, I'm like tagging on everything, right? But we're giving attention to like the maternal rates in Black women because it has become an epidemic at this point. Okay. But again, psychological diagnoses have been disproportionately negatively used to classify, dare I say, normal behavior among some groups compared to others. Um, misdiagnosis, we know about pain, right? Even until last year, we had medical students and residents who thought that people who were Black had thicker skin, who had a higher pain threshold, so therefore they didn't need any anesthesia. If you go back to how we got this lovely pap smear and the fistula um, surgeries, we know that enslaved Black women were operated on without anesthesia, like that speculum that if you have to have a pap exam you have, it was designed on an enslaved black woman's body without anesthesia, fistulas, same thing. And so racism literally kills us in so many ways. I heard, um, I was listening to an audio book, it's called The Three Mothers. A woman wrote about the mothers of James Baldwin, Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. And I'm gonna mess up this, this quotation, but give me give me some grace she essentially stated that black motherhood is like the biggest form of revolution that black women can have because their bodies were never their own their reproductive systems were never their own because enslavers would pair to enslave people together for the sole purpose of having more children so they could have more labor, which means they would have more money. So for Black women choosing to have kiddos now, that is an act of revolution. That's an act of freedom. For Black women choosing not to have kiddos right now, for having autonomy over their reproductive systems, that's an act of revolution. So when we see the maternal mortality rate so significantly high, when we think about all the things that Black mothers have endured to be mothers, if that don't make you slow down, I don't know what will, okay? Um, under treatment, we're not giving any pain medicine to a lot of Black and Brown people. Um, sleep disturbances and reduced performances last year, like following um, George Floyd's murder, like I shared with this in the um, CFHA plenary session last time, like I really was an awful clinician for about a month because the weight of being a Black person in the United States, the weight of feeling not valued um, because of something as arbitrary as the amount of melanin in my skin, it gets to you. Okay, so if you are a member of a minoritized group here on this, like just know that it's okay to not be okay and that racism will impact your ability to be productive. I think I had an attitude um, with just like the world in general because they wanted minoritized people to come to work and just act like nothing happened and like still have the same productivity levels. And I was like, for real, you really want me to act like that dude wasn't just murdered on the camera and just just do things, no, that's not gonna happen. And so if you're in any position of leadership in you know, an integrated primary here, just acknowledge that things like black people getting murdered, like, they, like it happened yesterday, we don't think too well on days after that or the day when that happens, like our productivity goes down. Um, and that's one of the consequences that we see. So if we as clinicians have reduced productivity, can you imagine like how our patients might be experiencing these things? Right, when literally people who look like them are, are being murdered on TV, okay? So this is where we're gonna hear the F-bomb. Y'all ready? Like, you'll hear damn and fuck. Let me just go ahead and get it out the way, okay? Those were the words. You'll hear it again, but give me a minute. I'm gonna do a new share for you. For people who still don't think that microaggressions are a problem. Oh, you're so well-spoken. Oh. Just imagine, instead of being a stupid comment, a microaggression is a mosquito bite. Ugh, it's a compliment. <laughs> oh. Mosquito bites and their itch are one of nature's most annoying features. But if you're only bitten every once in a while... No, where are you really from? Uh, Cleveland? Sure, it's annoying, but it's not that big a deal. The problem is that some people get bitten by mosquitoes a lot more than other people. I mean, a lot more. 
whether it's on a date. Oh, your English is so good. Excuse me? Going grocery shopping. You know, everything happens for a reason. I'm just buying apples. Commuting to work. So when are you going to have a baby? Watching TV. We have to keep the Redskins name. Part of our culture and history. Or just walking down the street with your partner. <gasps> I couldn't even tell you were gay. <sighs> Mosquitoes seem to pop up everywhere. Do you know John? Me shopping so bad I love Cher too. And getting bit by mosquitoes every goddamn day. Can I touch your hair? Multiple times a day. So pretty. Can, can I touch your hair? Can I please? It's fucking annoying. And makes you want to go ballistic on those mosquitoes. Which seems like a huge overreaction to people who only get bit every once in a while. It's just a mosquito bite. Who cares? Just another angry black one. Of course, beyond just being annoying, some mosquitoes carry truly threatening diseases that can mess up your life for years. Astrophysics? Hmm, maybe you should try this challenging major. Ow, my dreams. And other mosquitoes carry strains that can even kill you. It looked like he was up to trouble, okay? I felt threatened. So next time you think someone's overreacting, just remember, some people experience mosquito bites all the time. You're all so exotic, wow. And by mosquito bites, we mean microaggression. So my question to you all is, what bites have you left? Because some of us are, are mosquitoes, whether we intend to be or not. What bites have you left? All right. And so hopefully this is one of those things that makes you say, crap, I probably did bite somebody. OK, but yeah, ask yourself, what bites have you left? And how would you react when someone like starts scratching that bite? Where you like, dude, like, it's not that serious. Or were you like, I'm sorry, can I help alleviate that for you? But ask yourself, what bites have you left? Okay. And me, um, I know I'm talking about Black people in particular, but I can't ignore the fact that even though I am a Black person, I do hold privilege in several areas, including the fact that I'm cisgender heterosexual, so I know I have bit some people in that area. And I just got to be honest with myself about that. I know I have bit somebody. And um, I'm thankfully at the point where like when I bite, not if, when I bite, I have people around me who'll swat me. Yeah, thought you meant felt, but left is more apt. Interesting that they use the same, uh-huh. Yeah, which ones, how many times have you bitten somebody is what I meant, Tara. But yeah, I think alternately we can ask like, how many times have we been bitten? Like I said, I know I've, I've bit people. Um, and I'm going to say this again, but it were, it's worth me saying now. I don't care if you didn't mean to do it. Impact is always more important than your intention. So go ahead and put aside the feelings that come. We're like, but I didn't mean to. Who cares? You hurt, right? It's the, it's the impact and the harm that's caused. My best um, example for that is if like you and I are walking along side by side, having an awesome time, and then I accidentally step on your toe so hard that your big toe breaks. Does it not hurt anymore because I didn't mean to do it? it still hurts, okay? So let's make sure that we are mindful of focusing on impact. Yep, that's exactly it, Stacey. Impact is, is stronger, more powerful than intention. And I think we, when we focus on intention rather than impact, guess who becomes the target and guess who gets centered? The person who has caused the harm is the one who then becomes centered instead of the person who has been harmed and how we rectify that. So impact, way more important than intent. Doesn't mean you can't be sorry, but it means you can't like be like, oh my goodness, I didn't mean it. Who cares? You hurt somebody. Okay. So here's some more impacts of microaggression, psychological distress, anger. Did you hear the statement about being an angry black woman? Like I might as well just put that on my forehead. Can I tell you the number of times I have been called or like, you know, somebody thinks you're an angry black person. Like just go ahead and put it there. Like I'm the angry black person. I'm okay. You may have thought it as I've been talking today because I'm passionate about what I'm talking about. I don't care if you think I'm an angry black person, what else? Um, because my impact is to convey, right? My intent is to be as blunt and transparent as possible. So if you think I'm an angry black person, cool, we're on the same page. Um, we got some comments here and I'll keep going. I know about the ones when people spoke up and said, ouch, what about the ones I didn't realize exactly those mosquito bites that we leave and no one said, ouch. Yep, that impact is still there even though we didn't intend to hurt or even if we didn't know about it. Um, more important to self-reflect on what bites I have left and much harder question to ask. Yeah. And if you were to think about it, like a patient, a colleague, anyone like, have I bit you recently? 
like first of all that's an odd question but you know what I mean but like imagine how uncomfortable it would be to be like have I been racist to you first of all don't ever ask anybody that that puts the labor on them to figure out the times you've hurt them but hypothetically speaking if you were to be like hmm you know I, I went to this talk and I wonder if I've ever like been racist to you one, it's uncomfortable. And again, just don't do it that way. Okay. But no one wants to be uncomfortable and be like, let me talk about the ways that I have hurt you. Like, let's do this. This is going to be such a fun conversation. No one wants that. And the person who's been hurt doesn't want to talk to you about it either. Just uncomfortable. Um, perception of forced compliance, humiliation, loss of integrity, need to engage in code switching. Everybody know what code switching is? You may notice that, um, I don't really change how I talk that often because I've made a conscious effort to stop code switching. And if you think I'm an angry black woman as a result, that's on you. I am still conveying the information that I've learned. It is hard. It is so hard to like not comply to a standard that someone else has set for you in regards to how you're allowed to express anger and frustration and disappointment. I am doing my hardest to not code switch. I might slow down and like think a little bit longer, but it's rare that I change um, who I am or what I'm gonna say. It's incredibly anxiety provoking. And let me tell you, I, I, I can almost guarantee that people are minoritized, think about this way more than those who hold privilege in terms of skin color and race. Because we do have the stereotypes of being the angry black person or the angry black man or the violent man or somebody who sells drugs or someone who's going to get arrested because they looked at you wrong so we have to be like it's a risk for me to not code switch it's a huge risk for me to decide to be my authentic self okay think about your patient encounters i have seen one time too many patient was aggressive patient's voice was elevated Maybe they've decided they're not code switching with you. They're going to be their authentic selves. Maybe that's all that is. Or maybe they are coming with a load of trauma and baggage and they don't need to sugarcoat your feelings so they can get help. So again, let's shift how we're thinking about this. James Baldwin said to be a black person in this country is being rage almost all the time. That's it, Tanil. That is it. Um, Baldwin's my person. Um, when we think about microaggressions, it can alter the therapeutic or the clinical interaction. Um, a lot of providers who are not black or brown won't talk about race, okay? And let me just frame it in a way that hopefully will be overly simplistic, but will help you understand. If I am coming to see you um, for a medical visit for my diabetes, and you never ask me about my blood glucose levels. Would you think that was weird? Like that's a big contributing factor to whether or not my diabetes is well controlled or not. If I am a black person, and I'm coming to talk to you about trauma, about depression, about watching George Floyd die and you never ask me about being black, that's just like you ignoring my diabetes and my blood sugar numbers. That's a portion of who I am. Or if you are giving me a physical and you inspect every part of my body except my foot, why are you ignoring my foot? And I'm being sarcastic with the body part, but it's the same thing. Why are you ignoring my foot? Why didn't you also examine my foot? My foot is a part of who I am, but you want to skip the examination on my foot? Why? And again, being entirely overly simplistic, that's what happens when we pretend we don't see people's race, when we pretend we don't see the impact of racism, when we pretend we don't see any of the isms and the effect that they have on our patients. Ask about their foot. It's okay. Like we want you to. Okay. In general, it, it makes for a weaker partnership and relationship because patients might not feel safe to talk about those things with you because you've never asked. On the flip side, don't ask about it all the time. Don't be like, so you're black, huh? Hmm. What's it like to be black today? Cool. So you're black. Ooh, I, I have this one black friend. Never do that. Okay. But also don't skip their foot. Talk to them. Okay. You can overcome these things. Um, like I know myself, Whenever I mess up, whether it's with an intervention or whatever, I might say something to the effect of, I messed up. I want to fix it. I'm not going to ask you to tell me how to fix it, but I would like to fix it. And I just call it out. Because if I say, oh my goodness, what can I do to make it better? I'm now asking you to do the labor after I've already hurt you. I just acknowledge, I 
I messed up. And so when we skip people's feet, when we ignore their whole person, call yourself out and imagine the type of example you're set for your patient when you, in a position of power, acknowledges that you messed up and you work to repair and respect if they don't want to. They may just be mad at you and that's okay. Okay. Um, how do you respond to microaggressions? Daryl Wing Sue said, to speak or how to speak? That is the question, meaning you better speak up if you see it. Um, but we also know that when people get called out, these are some of the common reactions they have. Like, I'm not racist. I got a black friend. Um, I don't see color. You better see my color or else you're ignoring my foot if you're doing a physical of me and you don't see my color. We're all the same under the skin. Oh, I didn't mean that. I can't believe you would think I would say something like that. Thank you for gaslighting me. Appreciate that, right? And this is where I said that the impact is always more important than the intent. It doesn't matter if you meant to do it or not. You hurt somebody. And that's what we focus on. How do we repair the hurt that we made? Daryl Wing Sue also says that like there's some steps you could take if you recognize somebody um, having a microaggression against you or someone in your presence. Um, and essentially it's like, be clear share that like, I'm not trying to blame you, but I need you to acknowledge that this was hurtful. Ask about how they feel about hearing that information and then wait and listen. I included the last part um, because part of it is that you have to accept that they're not gonna change. I recommend going above them because if you're in an organization that is supposed to be taking care of any and everybody, but you got folk who won't even acknowledge that they hurt somebody and they won't listen to you, that's an organizational change. That's how we get at those institutional components of racism and any other isms. There has to be somebody you go up to. Like that can't be accepted behavior. That cannot be an acceptable culture where we have microaggressions against everybody and we just keep it moving like nothing happened. That cannot be acceptable. Um, Beautiful JAMA article about microaggressions by Roberto Montenegro. Thank you, Jeff, for putting that in the um, chat box. Click on it. It's a PDF too, so you don't even have to search. He did the good work for us. I love it when people share PDFs. So strategies for treatment. Again, I have no bells and whistles. I've just given you context and things to think about, okay? So let's think about the barriers to treatment. They're structural and they're provider level barriers. And let me just start by saying that I am aware of, um, I'm, I'm on Twitter a lot and I'm aware that some people's feelings are hurt because they've been called providers recently instead of anesthesiologists. When I think of provider, I'm talking about anybody who provides any level of care. I don't care what your degree is, but like somebody in the clinic doing something for the patient, okay? If you're mad at me, please feel free to communicate with me offline about that but I'm just letting you know what I'm, what I'm talking about. I don't, but again, if you're on Twitter, look up like provider versus anesthesiologist. It's a hot mess. Um, I bet you can guess who said the complaint. All righty, structural, later referrals to treatment. Um, it takes longer to get people into the higher level of care if they need it. And it could be doing part to the biases. So if there's like a pain referral specialist or something like that, well, if black people have thick skin, they don't need a referral to pain management. Like, why would they need that? Like they can't feel pain the way other people feel. So no, I'm not gonna submit that. And that may not be the words that you say, but if that is the thinking that has influenced your clinical decision-making to date, it may very well stop you from sending on that referral to the next level. Higher rates of involuntary commitment. Remember that whole psychosis piece? We see a lot more black males in particular being um, involuntarily committed. And guess who comes to pick them up in most states? The police. Guess who's terrified of police right now? Most black people, okay? And then fewer specialty services in communities that serve black people, African-American patients. Um, in the United States, of all the licensed psychologists, only 4% are black. I am one of the 4%. There are maybe five of us total in all of Knoxville, which has 186,000 people. Um, can't take care of everybody, which means that for those of us who aren't black, I'm black, but you know what I mean? Like we have to do better about meeting the needs of people who are because 
we don't exist in abundance, okay? Um, more frequent diagnoses if you're a provider, bias, lack of cultural humility. Notice that the title of today's conversation was cultural humility because our goal is to understand. Our goal is to, to question, to learn, okay? But I will give you, ooh, I think I'm about to step on toes, but I'm gonna do it. Um, <clears throat> it's 2021, so I know everybody knows that, but I will tell you that people who are minoritized don't wanna hear how we're listening and learning anymore. Racism has been here since our country has been here. It's 2021, what else do you need to learn? It's time to start doing some things to rectify. And so the cultural humility component is about acknowledging the roles that we play, acknowledging the mosquito bites that we have left and then doing something about it. But I tell you a pet peeve is, is people saying they're listening and learning. I'm like, really, really? In 2021, you wanna listen? and learn, I haven't heard any action steps yet. Stop listening and learning and do. So from a cultural humility perspective, we are learning what to do and then we're gonna do it, okay? And so if I stepped on your toes, cool, but it's 2021. We know racism exists, it's been around forever, okay? And then fewer providers with similar racial backgrounds. Again, 4% of us in the United States are black as licensed psychologists. Then there are individual cultural barriers to care delayed problem recognition. And it could be that no one's coming into the clinic because why would you come to the clinic when people have harmed you, right? Misused your power, misused their power against your body. Why would you come in and be like, oh my goodness, I need you to help me by exploring all these body parts that, you know, something's not right. And I trust you fully to take care of my body. Said no person ever, okay? Delayed entry into care, fear of stigma, discrimination. And I'm talking about people who are coming in for like blood pressure and diabetes, but let's add on some more stigmatizing identities. Let's say they're gay. Let's say they have HIV. Let's say they use IV drugs. Let's say they smoke weed, right? Why would they come in and see us? And then historical abuse of power by medical providers. Notice I did not say mistrust because guess who deserves the blame? the medical providers who have historically abused their power, not the people who don't trust them. That's why I don't like this whole phrase vaccine hesitancy because that puts the onus on the person to become less hesitant rather than the system to stop oppressing people. They're not hesitant. They are using lived experience to not trust you. You need to change, not them. And then same thing with historical racism and bias, medical racism. I've given you some things like with gynecology, of course, there's syphilis withholding care. Then there are the injections of plutonium in Black people. There's the testing of depo purveyor on Latinx women. When we think about people not wanting to get an injection, why would they? Things have been put into their bodies without their permissions for so long. Why would they want a vaccine? Okay. Plutonium has been injected into Black people's bodies. Depo Provera, i.e. sterilization, was done to Latina women. Why would they trust you a needle? And so this has nothing to do with them. This is the historical abuse of power. They're not hesitant. They're real, okay? And then mislabeling the act of running away as a disease. They were psychotic because how dare they not want to be enslaved anymore? Then we think about cultural mistrust. It makes sense to be paranoid. Like... Why wouldn't you be? And this healthy stigma, I mean, not the stigma, but this healthy distrust of people who have historically caused, caused harm, it's protective. It's protective. And if we think of it otherwise by saying they're being non-adherent, non-compliant, those are those institutional policies and languages that we need to change. This is not non-adherence. This isn't non-compliance. These are people who have a history of power systems mistreating them. Okay. And so I want you all to kind of keep these things in your head. Also know that it has nothing to do with you if they don't want to tell you their whole life story. Like people in black communities were raised to take it to Jesus first. There's some people outside the home you don't even tell, like you keep your stuff to yourself. So if they don't want to tell you their business, that has nothing to do with them being resistant or being, you know, guarded or being non-adherent. It means you're not their family and that's not the worldview that they've been raised with. So your one time meeting them may not change that and that's okay, like you still fine. How do we engage black or African-Americans? 
we make sure that we address the barriers. So we talked about structural characteristics. Think about times when the clinic is open. Don't be mad when a person brings their kiddo to the appointment. Don't be mad if they're running 15 minutes late, especially if they're working to get to their, you know, their appointment and they're using like public transportation. I don't know if anybody knows this, but here's the thing. When I grew up, I didn't have a bed until I was eight. I slept on the floor. We didn't have a car until I was like 10. So every taxi, every bus, like I could tell you the bus line by the age of 10. I didn't sleep in my bed until maybe the age of nine because it felt weird sleeping in a bed when my whole life all I knew was the floor. Of course, when I was a baby, I had a crib, but then I was too big for the crib. So I slept on the floor on blankets. We cannot get mad for people bringing those lived experiences into the clinic with them. Okay, you never would have known that I didn't have a bed until I was eight unless I told you. But if you're talking to parents about like co-sleeping or making sure the kiddos are sleeping in a way, don't assume they have the resources it takes to do all the things we're recommending. We can't just assume that everybody has the same lived experience, okay? So if they bring those kiddos in, if the kiddos are like chewing on the, on the bottle at two, like gently correct, but don't judge, okay? Because we don't know what they're dealing with. This goes for anybody, really. Interpersonal characteristics, like work to reduce the mistrust. Real simple things. If you say you're going to do something, do it. Like if you say you're going to call them, call them. It's really simple things that can build the trust. And again, this is for all of our patients, but for people who have been harmed by people in power in medicine, we have to work that much harder to restore that trust. And yes, it is our responsibility. It's not theirs. It's our responsibility to change so that we create a system worth trusting. Take time to build that trust and rapport. Use multiple treatment modalities. One size does not fit all. Jeff put another good nugget in there. The cost of racism for people of color, contextualizing experiences of discrimination. I think I have that on my bookshelf. But um, don't assume that every single patient that we see will respond to the same treatment modality. It's not that they're not adherent, it's not that they're resistant, it's not that they're non-compliant, it means that you aren't adapting the intervention for them and it's your job, the person facilitating the care to change it, to meet the needs. Um, how do you address it? Don't ignore it. How do you feel like working, how do you feel like working with a right white therapist or a white medical provider or a white whoever? Okay. But remember, don't, don't ask about it all the time. That's just, that just gets weird because then everything gets framed around the fact that they're black and there are other contributing factors to what we see. Avoid trying too hard. So I know I'm asking you to walk a tight line, a tight rope, like make sure you ask, but don't ask too much. Make sure you try, but don't try too hard. I get it. I have no formula to offer you. Okay. This is something trial and error. We will hurt feelings. We will need to apologize. We will need to restore relationships. And then avoid the assumption that racial similarities are going to enhance the relationship. So I can't assume that every Black patient is going to be like cool with having me or that we're going to have a shared lived experience because we're not, like it's simply not the case, okay? Um, and then consider protective factors, things like spirituality, religion, communalism, particularly in the case of like COVID-19, we have heard... Um, Goodness, yeah, the line is hard to find. Hi, Anita. I didn't know you were up here. I went to school with her too. Um, the line is hard to find. Like, how do you balance trying but not trying too hard, right? And you will fall. Absolutely, right? Um, think about external locus of control. Um, not everybody was raised with the idea that if you work hard, you can get everything you, you work for. Some of us work hard and still get the door slammed in our face. And so you try to change the things around you, maybe not necessarily the way you think about things, but like some of us have seen the door slam so many times that it's like, well, what's the point of me changing? We can't assume they're being non-adherent, non-compliant when an external locus of control is a thing that we hear. And then lastly, can I tell y'all like how excited I was to find this GIF right here? Look at it move, it's moving. It took me a minute, like that is the hallmark of this whole presentation. These last few minutes, I just want you to watch that thing swing. It took me a minute to figure out how to make it work. But either way, think about protective factors. Yes, Bridget, thank you. Um, chosen family, family, members of their religious or spiritual community, um, 
positive identity development. There's some research by a colleague of mine, her name is Dr. Rihanna Anderson, and she's at the University of Michigan. And she talks about how for black kiddos, um, teaching them about the positive components of their history is one of the best things you can do to build their self-esteem, okay? Um, and so in general, in general, no pun intended, don't generalize, make sure that we individualize and things. Um, in my last four minutes, I will see if I can answer this question for you, Stacey. It says, can you talk a little bit about providers in primary care being mindful of stereotypes and level of acculturation within the African diaspora, working with patients who are African, but not from the US. Black is a term that not all African cultures use to describe themselves. Absolutely. And so I think in general, this slide right here, like making sure that we individualize everything we do is gonna be really important, but you're right, like here, on Thursdays, we see um, individuals who are newly resettled refugees who are coming into East Tennessee. And so they're from a host of countries in Africa, right? We can't assume that their experience is the same as anybody else that I may have described today. And I think just encouraging our team members to be curious, but not annoying, again, another line, um, will help us to make sure that we are addressing their needs in a way that's most meaningful to them instead of attempting to, um, again, do a one size fit all approach. But I think it's absolutely important to, to represent that we are not a monolithic group, that there's variety, right? Um, so yeah, I think that's the best we can do is just reinforce that. I got two minutes left. What you got? Ebony, I got a question. Yeah. All right, so uh, <laughs> I'm nervous. Do I'm it, nervous. do it, do it. So I do this weird thing that uh, when I have a black patient where I want them to know internal, like, I don't know, it's like this internal thing where I want them to know, like, I'm aware of these things. I'm aware. And so, you know, what you're saying about it being hard to find that line. So I will bring up, uh, especially given the client and with the contextual interview at that point, I know enough about, I know enough about like, uh, aspects of their life to kind of say like, Hey, and how was your experience of moving to Yakima? Um, uh, have you experienced, you know, any difficulty, any racism. And I never quite know if they say no right away, then I feel like I don't know what to do from there. And I normally just awkward way, my way through it uh, and just say, oh, okay, well, hey, if anything comes up, you know, and then I feel like I'm being like the white helper who's like, well, if anything comes up and like handle it with care. So just any practical tips. I, I know you got to read the situation, know the context. You but said if, you gave them a yes or no question. What's the most comfortable response, especially when they don't know you like that? Nope. It'll probably be I've never no. experienced yeah, I don't remember. that. That's a great one, though. I don't remember might, how I exactly asked it, but that's awesome. But you might say something to the effect of it's, you know, a lot of people of color or Black people who come here have shared, you know, that they've encountered some experiences that have been discriminatory. Which ones have you experienced? Is that something you want to address? Not have you experienced racism? You're a white person in power. No, they're not going to tell you about racism if you ask it like that. What about, um, can we just say, tell me about your experience or is that kind of? That assumes they want to tell you. Oh, okay. So like which you're ones have you're demanding that they tell you about their experiences of racism. If you just say, tell me about that. But I would couch it by saying, look, I've heard from a lot of patients or clients who've experienced these things. And I want you to know that this is a space that if you need to talk about it, I'm available. What have you experienced so far? Is that something you want to talk about? Okay, awesome. Love it. Thank Normalize you. first. Yeah, that was good. That was good, Catherine. Love it. Thanks, Lori. My internship uh, director is up here too. I love y'all. Y'all just came to say, hey, I love it. Lori Zeman. She was my internship uh, director in Detroit. Hi. Uh, thank you, Jeffrey. I appreciate that. He says that I speak with power and conviction. I try, all jokes aside, I try. But again, I know that I get perceived as an angry black woman sometimes and that's on y'all. Good. All righty, well, I will acknowledge that it's 201 and or 101, depending on where you are. I have provided the PDF of all the slides. Um, my email address, firstname.lastname at CherokeeHealth.com. Please stay in touch with me. Bye, y'all.